morning. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and teach us through your word, the sword of the Spirit, what you would have us learn this morning. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Well, in preparing this sermon on 1 Timothy 2, I was greatly comforted to know that even the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Peter, find some of the content of Paul's letters hard to understand. The passage contains some of the most sensitive and most controversial verses in all of Paul's letters. It has significant implications for how Christian men are to see and treat women, for ministry in the church, and for women's rights. That said, the content of verses 1 to 7 is actually much more important and thankfully much easier to understand and interpret. Do you know what God wants? Well, the answer is right there in verse 4. This is what is really on God's heart. God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And according to Paul, there's only one way to that salvation and truth, only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people to free us from our captivity to sin and death. The apostle knows what, God's want, what God wants, and it's the advance of the gospel that is uppermost in Paul's thinking from the very start of this letter. He's writing to Timothy when, with instructions that will promote that advance. And that necessarily involves working to eliminate the detrimental effects of controversial speculations and false doctrines, verse four. Indeed, this letter begins and ends with warnings about false doctrine. Paul's closing remark at the end of the final chapter is to urge Timothy to guard what had been entrusted to him because there were those who were departing from their faith in favor of opposing ideas. Well, today, Jesus is still the only mediator between God and man. He's still the only ransom for sin. And it's now our job as Christians to get that good news out. Of course, making such an exclusive claim these days is seen as the height of political incorrectness, as I mentioned in my sermon a couple of weeks ago. But we know for sure that that's what God really wants. And so we've got to work out how best to go about it, regardless of how unsympathetic or antagonistic the cultural context of our day is. The other thing Paul knew for sure that God wanted was that his people live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness, verse 2. Paul expresses his concern, as he does in other letters, that those in the church community should do nothing to bring the gospel into disrepute. Establishing good order in the church was undoubtedly also in Paul's mind as he penned this letter. Now, I don't think anyone would disagree that good church order is a good thing. What's controversial is what Paul goes on to say in verses 11 and 12, you may have noticed. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, yeah, I was the lucky one to, to uh, get assigned this reading. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. This could be my last day here, so it's been nice working with you. Our minds immediately jump to if and how we are supposed to apply this teaching to our own situation. Did it only apply to the women in Ephesus nearly 2,000 years ago, or does it apply to all women, even women today? 
What we're really getting at in asking that great question is, does this passage give us a pattern to follow or principles to live by? And we have to ask exactly the same question when we read many other passages in the Bible. When Jesus told his disciples to wash one, another, wash one another's feet, was he giving us a pattern to follow or principles to live by? If Jesus meant to give us a pattern to follow, then why are we not following it? When was the last time you washed somebody's feet? But if, on the other hand, he meant to give us principles to live by, then we ask, are we living lives of self-effacing and humble service? When Paul tells Timothy he wants men everywhere to pray, Lifting up holy hands, in verse 8, was he giving us a pattern to follow or principles to live by? If he meant to give men everywhere for all time a pattern to follow, then why are we not following it? But no, we say it's the principles of the verse we need to take on board, namely that everyone presumably women included, should pray in an attitude of holiness and peace. When we come to Paul's instruction that men should not teach or assume authority over a man, there are those who hold that it is a pattern that all women should follow. And indeed, it is this view that is prevailing more and more within our own Anglican Diocese of Sydney even though a high-powered theological review commissioned by the diocese found that there was no conclusive reason to stop women teaching men or mixed congregations. There are still, however, ministers and parishes that welcome women, uh, women in their pulpits. At St. Swithin's, we have appreciated the preaching of some very gifted, capable, and inspiring women like Jenny Stoddard, Suz Gorham, and Marcia Cameron, and more recently, the teaching of several others via our online daily devotions. Whilst we agree that Paul didn't want women preaching in Ephesus at the time he wrote to Timothy, we hold it was not a pattern to follow ad infinitum. After all, Paul also mentions men he didn't want preaching at Ephesus. The only people Paul wanted teaching in Ephesus at the time is is himself, or was himself, Timothy, and the teachers Timothy put in place. The pattern to follow, I believe, is the testing, the approval, and the appointment of people with the appropriate virtues for the task as Paul goes on to outline in chapter 3. The principle uh, uh, is to guard the preaching of the gospel from heresy. And so the stakes are high. Now the bishop, our bishop, in his wisdom, has given me a license, authority, if you like, to preach in this church. I don't have it on me, but it's there somewhere. But as you well know, that license, that authority, is conditional on my submission to and faithful proclamation of the Word of God as my authority, just as it is for any woman who stands up to teach and preach. It has nothing to do with our gender. The authority comes from the word of God. I started by saying that these verses are extremely difficult to interpret. The fact is that even top scholars can't reach a consensus on their interpretation. Some say the passage here is referring to women. Others say it's referring to wives because rather unhelpfully, the Greek word gune is used for both woman and wife. Another difficulty is the way in which Paul argues. No doubt many of us remember our maths teachers telling us not just to write 
the answer to a question, but to ensure that we included all the steps we took along the way to arrive at the solution. Now, it would have been really helpful if Paul had done that, but he didn't. Uh, there are gaps in his argument. As someone who knew exactly what was going on in Ephesus and who was very familiar with Paul's teaching, presumably Timothy could easily fill in the missing gaps. But for us today, at some point or other, the interpretation of this passage has to be speculative. And so it is that even Christians who are seeking to be utterly faithful to God's word arrive at different conclusions. This being the case, we must be respectful of each other. As the great reformer Calvin concluded, the discerning reader should come to the decision that the things which Paul is dealing with here are indifferent, neither good or bad, and that they are forbidden only because they work against seemliness and edification. Well, where do we start to tackle these verses? Just as with any Bible text, we must start by trying to get to what it meant to the original, in the original context, and especially to what the writer intended the original readers or hearers to understand by his words. How this meaning is then applied to us today is a vital question, but it's a separate one. Now, apparently, rookie pathologists often make, make incorrect diagnoses because they're too quick to take a high-powered, focused-in view of small details. To correctly understand the Bible's teaching, I think similarly, it's vital to take a big-picture view of how God has revealed his purposes over time. Doing this, we're much better placed to correctly understand the smaller details. The academic, the scholar Graham Cole says, the challenge to the interpreter is not simply to put the text in its context, vital though that is. Rather, the fuller task is to place the text in its context, in its argument, in its literary unit, in its book, in, its, in the canon, in the light of the flow of redemptive history. Now, uh, I'm going to take the next 45 minutes to do that. Uh, it's quite a tall order, isn't it? Uh, and we're only skimming the surface here. But here are a couple of clues that help give us a picture of the cultural context of the day. Firstly, we know that Ephesus was home to one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis who was worshipped as the daughter of Zeus and Leto. Artemis was adverse to marriage and childbearing, apparently due to the horrors her mother endured at her birth. But it's safe to assume that some of the leading women in Ephesus that had been involved in this cult of Artemis were now making a place for themselves in the church. So rather, Paul's rather odd word of encouragement about childbearing in verse 15 is perhaps a rebuttal of that rejection of marriage and childbearing. Secondly, at the time when Paul was writing, women were generally regarded by men in a light that today we would describe as despicable. Men generally considered women inferior and not worth teaching. Indeed, scholars think that less than 10% of women got any education. In Jewish and Gentile cultures, it was extremely rare, in many cases unheard of, for a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. In Rome, women were seen as part of the husband's property. This standard in the first century was beginning to pass, but nevertheless, the old attitudes were still there. If it was the case that Paul's instruction for women not to teach had to do with women's general lack of education, and especially education in the scriptures, 
his encouragement in verse 11 for women to learn was not just countercultural, it actually offered a practical long range solution to the deficiency. The third thing to say about context is that scripture is its own best interpreter. Paul himself affirms this by stating all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So what can we find in the rest of the Bible that sheds light on the issue of woman teaching and assuming authority? That big picture view. Let's start with Paul himself in the New Testament. Paul gives similar teaching in 1 Corinthians 14, saying that a woman is not permitted to speak in church but must remain silent. But the fact is, a lot of Paul's teaching elsewhere seems to contradict this position. Writing to the church in Corinth, Paul exhorts the brothers and sisters there to eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Writing to the Colossians, and without any mention of gender restrictions, he exhorts them to teach and admonish one another. And here's an interesting bit of context. In Titus 2, verse 10, Paul expresses his concern about making the teaching of God, our Savior, attractive. Now, it seems Paul was really very successful in making the gospel attractive to women. Of the 26 people Paul lists in Romans chapter 16, Eight of them are women, including Phoebe, who's described as a deacon, Priscilla, who's listed ahead of her husband Aquila, and Junia, who's said to be outstanding among the apostles. When Paul preaches in Thessalonica and Berea, we're told that quite a few prominent women responded in both towns. Now, Personally, I think it's safe to assume that being told to be silent purely on account of their gender would have been just as unattractive to intelligent and capable women those days as it is to intelligent and capable women today. Why was the church able to attract such women as opposed to putting them off? In Acts 2, what happens at Pentecost is seen as the fulfillment of the words of the Old Testament prophet Joel. In, these, in the last days, God says, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Does that mean women hadn't prophesied in the Old Testament? Well, let's have a look. We read in Exodus 15 about Miriam, and there she was described in verse 20 as the prophet. Her song of praise is recorded in Scripture. And so, according to Paul himself, her words were God-breathed and God-inspired. In Numbers 12, verses 1 to 2, Miriam and Aaron complain against Moses, saying, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? Hundreds of years later, the prophet Micah admonishes Israel with these words. Listen to what the Lord says. I sent Moses to lead you also Aaron and Miriam. You know that little verse in Micah 6? Anybody start the discussion on women in ministry from Micah 6? <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't heard it anyway. So there you have it. Three references that clearly indicate Miriam had a national speaking and leadership role. Exactly the same can be said of Deborah and Huldah. 
Have you ever heard of Hulda? Now, if God called these women to act as leaders under the old covenant of law, why would he not call similarly capable and inspired women to lead under the new covenant of grace? To my mind, that's going no further than the line of reasoning we use to support infant baptism. We read about the baptism of households in the New Testament, but not expressly the baptism of infants. But we argue from covenantal theology that if God welcomed Israelite children into the blessings of being a member of the old covenant community, a covenant of law, how much more would he not welcome children of believing parents into the blessings of being a member of the new covenant community, a covenant of grace? And what about the whole sweep of salvation history? What clues can we gather from that? Well, in Genesis 3, 16, God tells Eve that man will rule over woman. It's debatable whether God was describing or prescribing the curse of male domination. But what we do know is that regardless of Paul's unflattering remarks about Eve in verses 13 and 14 of 1 Timothy 2, Christ came to redeem us from the curse of sin and death, including the curse of inequality and abusive relationships. Is that not what Paul himself had in mind in Galatians 3.28 when he says, there is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There are those who argue that that verse is focusing only on our spiritual status in Christ. But it's interesting to note that many of those who developed a biblical argument for the emancipation of slaves in the 19th century found that the conclusions they reached led them to argue also for the emancipation of women. Sadly, the curse of inequality and abusive relationships is still with us. But praise God, we know now the glorious destination to which redemptive history is moving. And personally, I find it difficult to understand why God would move everything forward in his redemptive purposes. Give women the job of witnessing and proclaiming its key events, the death and res resurrection of Jesus, and then, for some unknown reason, choose to backpedal on the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy at Pentecost. And why would God backpedal on the elimination of the curse of male domination within his church, which is supposed to be uh, providing a foretaste of heaven? And so, to my mind, there must be another answer, another way of reconciling these apparent contradictions. Perhaps the reason Paul prohibited women from teaching was because they were inadequately prepared and or they were teaching heresy. In chapter 5, verse 13, Paul alludes to the fact that the misinformed were targeting vulnerable women to spread their teaching. One theory is that prominent women who had come into the church from the cult of Artemis were now t teaching some of its ideas like that marriage and childbearing were bad. In that case, it would make perfect sense for Paul to write to Timothy, telling him to silence them. Just as he wrote to Titus in Crete, telling him to silence the circumcision group there. Allow me to finish on a personal note that takes me back to a friend of mine 40 years ago. Kathleen Young was then 40 years old and a recent widow. She gave me a lift to university for four years. We did our 
Bachelor of Divinity course together and taught Sunday school together. I, remem I remember traveling home with her after an exam one day and Kath Kathleen expressing her extreme disappointment that she'd only been able to write 10 pages on one particular question. I don't think I said anything because that was five times more that I had been able to answer any question. Uh, only one of the 20 or so men in our class came anywhere near Kathleen academically. In 1990, Kathleen became one of the first women to be ordained into the priesthood in the Anglican Church of Ireland. Ten years later, she was made a canon of St. Anne's, of St. Anne's Cathedral, Belfast. And in 2007, she received an MBE from the Queen herself for 17 years of faithful service to the community in Northern Ireland. I think it should be a cause of deep sadness to all of us in the church to acknowledge the fact that thousands upon thousands of potential Kathleen's have been lost to the church down through the ages. Highly and intelligent and capable women who have been ready and willing to do what pleases God by sharing their knowledge of the truth, but who haven't been supported and who haven't been, or who have been actively discouraged to do so. And don't get me started on uh, the, anom the anomaly of churches supporting women to teach and do whatever in Bongo Bongo land, but not welcoming women to preach in their home church. Such are the dangers and legal, legalistic pitfalls involved in building a, uh, a theology on uh, uh, two highly debatable passages of scripture, to my mind. I find it very hard to believe that that is really what Paul wanted. And given the countercultural way Christ treated women, I find it very hard to believe that that was his intention. The priesthood of all believers was, was one of the great biblical concepts the early reformers rediscovered after centuries of professional male-dominated ministry. The truth that men, women, and children have equal access to God through Christ and that together we have an equal part in doing what he wants. And that brings us back to where we started. We know, we know for sure what God wants. He wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. As Paul says in Romans 10, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want to encourage every sister of mine listening to this with one last thing that's for sure. You have exactly the same number of beautiful feet as men. May God richly bless you as you use them to do as Miriam and the woman at the empty tomb did to praise God's name and advance his gospel. Amen.